by being good at that kind of stuff, right? Tom, what have you noticed the past 10 years in the NHL changes like you've gone to these tickets games and you and you more than that gone to practices. What's the biggest difference you've observed? You're kind of coming in and out here on mine. Uh, the biggest thing I think I've noticed is they know how to use the no red line now. Okay. If you watch their breakouts, every breakout, like if they have moving it up ice, if you pinch on them. Yeah. Like I was watching last night because I was teaching it last night, so I really watched uh, some of the games last night. Everyone, the strong side forward goes up against the D at the blue line, about a meter from the boards, not right against the boards. And he's a chip out option or a touchback option. Yep. Wide winger slashes across and goes right to the far blue line on the strong side. Yeah. So it drives the you know, drives the D off the off the line, right? Yeah. They're moving, otherwise, they get breakaways. Yeah. The other thing is, instead of the traditional uh, triangle, everybody on the fast attack is using the uh, middle drive. No. And with the back pressure, first forward back chasing the puck carrier, that wide guy, unless F2 gets him, he's open. No. Get that cut across. That, you'll see lots of goals on that. Last night, I was watching uh, Colorado for a while. They were doing scissors all over the place. You know, even up above, they were, a car would skate across, and other guy would come behind him, and do scissors to each other. And uh, now the big deal is uh, defense is you divide the defensive zone into a square, line down the middle, and so there's four squares yeah. and everybody defends their square and the center has to go everywhere a lot of players they do a lot of stuff up high now they expand the, maybe they move the net back two feet and the blue line out two feet and they take advantage of that big space between top of the circle and the blue line yeah and the center a lot of teams like Dallas, uh, las vegas started last year the center has to be up all over the place. He's a backup to everybody. So it's a little different than man on marks behind. Yeah, we're doing it and they're struggling. I use people all the time. The Vegas is such a good defense. So those are the kind of the team plays. And plus, players are coming in. There's no fourth line anymore, really. There's a fourth line. But it's not a, you know, crash and bang line like it used to be and somebody hits one of those cars one of those guys that keep the crap out of them you know like you know there's not there's not a lot of those players around anymore like Toronto's got that Reeves and he can't keep up anymore so you know the game's changing in that way and you know like they used to say always you're starting to body check if you go and you hit a guy you take yourself out of the play now, if you hit a guy hard, you basically get a penalty. So those are things that we're talking about. Uh, somebody's getting, I'm getting some background sound. It's more like wind. That stopped. Well, Peter left. So, Tom, we're just carrying on the conversation. You are sort of keep such close track of the NHL, what are you doing uh, that you are keeping up with the game with with your U15 team? Well, I, I haven't seen many this year, but I've gone to multiple pro practices and, you know, even the, the world, all of Canada's teams they follow, they do the same stuff, right? Yeah. And go watch them practice, so... See the trends, the way, you know, the trends way practices are, you know, like the uh, Carolina drill we did last night, that 2-0 and down the middle, it passed, and then 3-0 the other way, it goes end-to-end. -end. Yeah. That's uh, that's from Bill Peters coaching in Carolina. 
you know, I watch them practice a couple of times when they're here. That's a great drill. And those, you know, I, I, I disagree with doing the middle drive. If there's players in front of you, it's really easy coverage. I think you got to go back to way Kresge and Curry did you create a two on one on the widest guy. The yeah. other guy to the net and the fourth player come up, you know, like coffee did all the time. And I yeah. see that happening a lot now. Yeah. They're creating two on ones on the widest guy. There's no use racing them if they're back. You're not going to beat them, right? If they're already back. Yeah. If they're using a passive four check. So you have to create. Uh, who uh, Belfry calls it the four chamber attack. Yeah. Wide chamber and the dot chamber on the side. And then the other guy goes to net. And yeah. So basically like Gretzky, Curry and coffee did all the time. And Semenko went hard to the net. Yeah. Did Semenko go wide hard or middle hard? Well, he'd be he'd be on the left wing, right? Yeah, so he'd go. He, yeah, he was going. Hard. He was going to the net. No. And then uh, you know, and then Gretzky would decide whether he was going to pivot and give it to uh, Curry or or Coffee, or if he was going to just cut in. If they backed in, he'd cut into the middle himself. Yeah. And then both go to the net. Yeah. You know, and I. And uh, even last night, I even saw Colorado, I think it was, doing the low spread power play. Two players behind the net. Yeah. Play in the middle and the D move up a bit. Yeah. And they did that a little bit and slid into the 1-3-1. One, one. Yeah. I think that's such a good way because everybody's back gets turned. It's yeah. really hard to keep track of people. And, you, you know, you lose them for a second. It's hard to look one way, then the other way. And, yeah. Well, Tom, yeah, uh, <clears throat> the other night I was talking to a couple parents who are, really watched the game closely, and they questioned the lack of a power play of uh, the particular team that we were watching practice. And I mentioned you and the idea that <clears throat> you follow the game so much that you know what the 1-3 umbrella is, and you've introduced it to your U15s, but you also put the two players below the goal line so people turn their backs. Yeah. Um, so you're 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 creating more structure, yet the kids are they really able to play within your structure? Oh yeah. They don't and we don't I don't want them to race like the flames can't score in the power play because they're the only thing they want to do in the rush is set up. In the one three one, so they don't try to score. And I, I listened to Gullets and talk about their power play, <coughs> and he said he used to do that. And he says he learned he's got to let the players try to score on the rush. Then you win the loose puck, then you set up your power play. The Calgary has a hell of a time getting over the blue line. They're getting stopped there all the time because, you know, they do these little passes, you know, ten feet inside the blue line, and they get jammed. They don't try to score on the rush. So, you know, so our philosophy is you try to score on the rush, you know, you win the loose puck and then, you know, then set up whatever is, uh, happens after you win the loose puck. Like I've, I've always mentioned the same thing, Tom, um, with the national women score on the rush is the first object. Maintaining control and setting up a second, and a part of that is your free puck battles to make sure you have control. So I just use the term possession overrides position, swarm the puck, and the D can pinch to the goal line on a power play. Yeah. So those to me are, you know, fundamental tactics, yet teams sort of say we're playing a 1-3-1, one, one, they try to play it. And the players think that arrangement and they can't execute because it's a flowing read as you play scenario. We should say hi to Jordan here. Hi, Jordan. Jordan, how about your power play at U18? Well, our power play at the U18, I got a sunshine in my eyes. Just a second.
Um, much like Tom had suggested there, it's uh, um, giving them uh, some, a little bit of uh, structure, but not really systems. I go with the, with the, um, well, what you'd shared Wally about George Kingston talking about supporting the puck in L's, which I guess if you looked at it uh, in uh, basketball, John Wooden and, and, uh, and Michael Jordan and those crew, it's actually triangles is what you're supporting it in when you're supporting it at L's. And then the other is that looking at, uh, um, looking at what Wayne Fleming talked about making short passes, then a long pass or long pass, then a short pass uh, in trying to make sure that there's puck movement. And uh, I've been stressing all along with them that the importance of moving the puck rather than than skating the puck around in the zone and so we use the badger bob uh one versus five or five versus one whichever you want to look at it in in practice uh so the kids can be creative and uh, uh our power play is is going okay uh, and, and right now it's uh all kids play on the power play and so it's uh important that they're all getting the opportunity to play and uh, we're going to look and see maybe after Christmas here, start formalizing power play units. But right now it's everyone gets the opportunity to play. And, and uh, right now with two kids now out with broken hand or wrist, uh, it's, uh, it's really important that everyone <laughs> knows what they're doing when they're out there. Well, Tom, uh, you know, one of the things on the power plate, Jordan and Tom, it, if you the one three one is your flank player being able to one time shoot, you know, everybody looks at the NHL and, and they see those flank players and they can hammer the puck. And back in the day when Bob Johnson did that five versus one, he did a two hour clinic on that game, change every 10 seconds, try to disrupt the five. All they did was get the puck to Lanny on the off wing for the one-timer. I don't know that they had a bumper in the middle or not, but the the no, one nobody time... Used a, they, nobody knew, used a 1-3-1 one, one in Bob Johnson's day. No. The, 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 only, play, the only thing that used a 1-3-1 one, one was <laughs> Finland. Yeah. And Johanny's team invented it. Yeah. And then it kind of drifted into all of hockey. TPS now, invented it. Now my point is, Tom, you practiced one-time shooting. And and I watched the drill. Everybody in pairs had a good demonstration with Jim feeding a player near the board, uh, not, you know, a distance from the boards and putting it in the wheelhouse and one-timing it. And everybody in pairs was doing it. Everybody was one timing the puck with a degree of force that impressed me at that young age. Well, that's a Swedish drill. Yeah. Their demonstration course is just one D and the, they get four shots. Yeah. So what happens is the one player has four pucks. So the shooter skates towards them. Yeah. They pass one touch it back, then go backwards, get a pass and shoot. And they do that four and they take turns. Yeah. It's a, it's a really good way. I really, I know it'll help the girls go on. If it's hard to find players, especially in the girls' hockey, that can one-time the puck. Yeah. So that's one skill that I really try to get that they they can do. So we do quite a few things. <coughs> like uh, we got one girl that's fantastic. At Cryway is fantastic at it. Yeah. So we got to get her in a position where she gets that. Cause she's playing bumper right now. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I think it's an important skill for kids to learn. Even, you know, even going to the net, right? That you can time it, and you know, yeah. even even if it's a catch, we work on catch and release a lot too. Yeah. So that catch the puck and release it, because you know those are the, that's how you score. Yeah. Usually quick. <clears throat> but our yeah. we scored two power play goals on Sunday. Yeah, but both were on the rush. We yeah. made uh, each of them. We made three passes on the third pass. The player 
you know, one was a rebound and, but that, you know, if we would just would have skated and tried to set up, yeah. you know, nothing would have happened. Right. Point made scored on the rush on the power play. Yeah. So. Now the one, the thing I wanted to do, Jordan and, and Tom, uh, you're at the level where this stuff is absolutely possible and you're making it happen. Those tactical skills, the passing skills, the IQ, the vision, the decision making. I just attended two U13 practices yesterday, and there one of the things that they were teaching was slap shot. And so my question is: You're working with U13 kids. The slap shot biomechanics is important, but the the big high wind up and the slap shot from the point. It's sort of like obsolete in the game today, but you still have to teach the wider grip, the firm grip of the bottom hand, and the powering down and the impact point and all those things. That's the challenge is teaching the slap shot, then half slap, and then those one timers might happen. I don't think if you have a slap shot, you won't be able to one time it. Yeah. You know, so you 13 kids with learning. They let yeah. their bottom elbow bend. Yeah. And, uh, you know, of course, had no torque on the stick, right? Yeah. So they got, they have to learn, like yesterday, we were doing your breakout at the start, you know, where the goalie passes. Yeah. And when they got, and there was going, there was no goalie because the goalies were passing. And I said, I want you to cross the blue line and take a slap shot. Because yeah. I want them all to learn to, because there's all that coordination of your body to yeah. get a slap shot off. And we, you know, I think it's important to learn how to slap shot. Yeah. Jordan, what about your team? Do you have shots blocked from the point? Five on yeah, five? Yeah, that's, uh, well, it was interesting. Um, with one of our players that uh, has uh, an injury and has been in the stands, uh, gave her the opportunity to uh, track shots. And uh, one of the stats on that is blocks. And it was, um, she charts them where they occur, um, originate on the ice, the attempts. And it was really uh, eye-opening for some of the kids to uh, look at it and see the fact that uh, we had lots of attempts and not many getting, not enough getting through percentage-wise, even compared to our opposition. And just that awareness piece, allowed kids to think about what they're doing. And I go back to what Hal had shared, uh, talking about the old days of the Minnesota North Stars. And when he said that the, he did his own research on it. And uh, when Minnesota attempted 13 or more slap shots from the blue line, they lost. And if they kept it under 13 attempts, they won. And it was just that those big wind up slap shots, they get, they meet shin pads more times than not. And we had one uh, D in the gold medal game that she scored two goals from the point. And uh, why did she score them? Because it was just on her stick and off her stick towards the net. They, uh, one was a heck of a shot. The second one, it was just, there were so many bodies through and that puck got through goalie. didn't have a chance. And that's the key is you got to get the shot through and it doesn't matter what kind of shot really. Yeah. If you stand still and take a long time to slap shot, it's probably going to get uh, blocked. But yeah. if you go out and back, you know, especially, you know, like Brent Burns is a guy that really started that get the puck and find a hole and shoot it right away. <laughs> you know, now that's basically what most players do now. Just go laterally and get your shot on and then and now they're not shooting on the ice or two inches off the ice. They're shooting wa waist height. And it's easier to tip. You know, and so that that's changed in the game too. They used to say, you know, shoot on the ice so a guy can tip it. But now guys, a lot of guys, they, they'll pick it off the D and shoot it down the ice. So you got to get the puck over the sticks and, you know, People are in front, and even the middle screen now they have the two screens with a one three one, or even on regular one guy screen the goalie and one guy's out of the hash, and that guy the hash tips a lot now. 
you know, on the, well, the other part with it, Tom, is the that uh, people are less willing to stand in front and block shots when they're coming in hard and high, too. Like that's uh, it's actually a strategy to get some of the opposition out of the way, too, because they're going to start bailing if if they're getting it into soft areas. Yeah. Yeah. But the key is, you know, you want the puck about waist height so that it's easier to tip up or down. I I have to leave for one minute here. Yep. Jordan, I when when I'm watching uh, the national team play and even watching the pros, I just years ago the first thing was one timers. And I remember John ba Jen Bonnerell staying out with me. I was the high person just feeding her pucks after the girls went off. And all she did was one time from the flank. And that sort of became her signature. And in the games that followed, it just working with that one player in the way that Tom did with all the players translated into the performance in the games. And it became a part of her um, performance. It's just the way she played. And I don't know how many people take the time to do deliberate one-timers with the national team. That was just me and one player who stayed out with me. And bingo, I saw the payoff. So I'm, I'm just thinking, he did this with everybody on the ice, all against the boards repeatedly, uh, 14 and 15 year old girls. It was mind boggling because they were hammering the puck. And I can imagine them being able to do that in a game if they can do it that well in practice. The timing factor isn't there, you know, the movement and the getting in the seam to shoot it, to one time it. Um, but the thing I've thought, Jordan, and I I don't know if it's doable at your level or Tom's, but when I watch the NHL, I say if, you're, if you have a touch pass on your power play, you're going to get a puck to, on the net. But if you handle a puck and pass, you're not. So to me, the key tactical offensive skill on power play is deceptive quick muck puck movement, which means touch passing or faking shots and passing, or even just redirecting the puck. And so the the you know the art of coaching, there's there's so many little details that go into the building blocks to come up with the final execution. I I'm uh, amazed because Tom's girls with that kind of repetition i mean they're doing nhl national team drills as well as those players and in fact i think they're so young they do it with more intensity uh they the practice pace of the girls at all the practices and even the two u13 teams i watch play uh no ghosting at all. They're absolutely giving it their all. So I, I don't know whether it's just girls or just at that age. They just want to, they don't know the difference between uh, lollygagging and hard work. They just hard work. So I'm pretty impressed, Tom, with particularly your team. But I haven't seen these other two teams practice for a while. I went out yesterday and uh, big improvement in their effort and their performance, stronger, harder shooting, harder passing. It's, uh, they're developing. I'm really, really impressed. I think a lot of it's got to do with how we chose our team. Yeah. For people who could skate and who competed hard. Because I think that if someone doesn't do that, it's really, that's the hardest thing to change. Eh? How, yeah. how much a person brings. They might be really skilled, but... You know, Pavel Brendel kind of a person. Yeah. Like that one, I remember I, there was a girl about four years ago, like she'd be a huge star. And I don't think she did much of anything in Bantam. 
she won all the awards and everything and she probably just finished midget a few years ago but she just had no intensity whatsoever and she was big and could stick handle and but that you know it is the hardest thing to change i think <coughs> Well, when you pick a team, I know, Jordan, you, you really look for certain things. And Tom mentioned he, he didn't really pick his team. He's, his son did it. Uh, can you talk about your me method of what you're looking for, Jordan, when picking a team? And then we'll get to Tom trying to talk about the team that his son drafted. Speaker, Jordan. I don't know if he's with us or not. Tom. Yeah, he's talking to somebody there. <laughs> Tom. Yeah. Oh, well, remember did... during that, those eight games we watched. Yeah. After every game, we went and sat at that table, the whole coaching yeah. staff. And we all, all four of us had input. Yeah. But I think uh, Jim and the girls saw more than I did about it. <laughs> yeah. They knew the players more than, you know, when I gave my input I, on players they mentioned. Yeah. But we, you know, we got there and, you know, and then the draft is you can get one out of three. So, you know, so last night they kind of dinged us. They said, well, you got first choice of boards last time because it was a draw. So they yeah. gave it to the red team and they got that Sawyer girl. But, uh, yeah, we just tried to, we, of course, we ranked everybody and, you know, and there was players we really wanted, but they got drafted first. So, but we were pretty, you know, pretty happy with the group we got, but, but we didn't take any players we thought just coasted around out there. Well, I looked at the th three you selected and I feel they were very good picks like if you in terms of all three choices i i thought okay you got the best deal um i just liked all of them because they they all work hard highly competitive and your your number one pick might be the most skilled player available who can skate and has hockey sense that she's going to develop more by being able to practice with you and play with you. Kyle feels that she can make a difference at your level, that she's that good. Now, you, she played for you last year. She was good. And this Which year, one? she's been a one-on-one -on -one player, outstanding. And now I've seen her making plays and trying to do it herself, which she can. Yeah, well, what we did is pick people that we either coached or came to our camp because we knew them a little bit. Because yeah. the other just kind of names on a sheet. Yeah. So. That's a good segue, Tom. Uh, Kyle Ooh. is taking um, my top defenseman on Sunday. Uh, with him to play um, Okotoks. And I was wondering if uh, I could take Jugnoth for Sunday. We play Sunday. We're in... We're in uh... I know. We play Sunday too, and Kyle's taking my top D. I, I, you know, I, I don't agree with taking people from games. I, I never do that. I take them from practices, but not from games. Because, uh, you know, so you got 5D now? Yeah. On the second of a back to back with Okotoks. Yeah, well, we're uh, second of a back to back, too. I, I don't know if. I don't know if I can get my affiliates. Well, Tom, the policy is you let them go and check on getting your affiliates. 
it's it's a GHC policy. It's not good for you, not good for Jordan. But if we don't have a policy, then we don't have a program. We've got independent. I know I have to look. Look, I know I have to let her go. Okay, I don't agree with it. Okay, we know that it's upsetting. I don't agree with it because you worked so hard to get some synergy, and I finally got her playing hockey properly. She finally stopped carrying the puck in our end all the time, and she played her best game by far on Sunday. And uh, you know, but yeah, you can use her. You got long term that, injuries. That, that's the dilemma, Peter Whitney. Are you still there, Peter? I wish we had an independent person on because in associations, it's really tough to make this happen. And it's really hard to accept because Jordan's no doubt lost his best D. Tom's lost his best D. And we're, we're there to develop the players as a whole, not just the outcome of our team in the moment. But that's sort of what my position is to try to stand up for that and um, the draft picks, when they we did the U15 picks, Tom, the ones you did yesterday, my concern, my concern was, would they be able to play in games and be able to play all situations? Uh, because that's a bigger jump, you going from uh, U13. I wouldn't call up a U13. I'd probably call it if I had Sawyer. Yeah. The only one, the, the other ones, there's no way they could do it. Because uh, the girls I coached last year, who were really good at U13, couldn't, you know, they weren't ready for this level. Well, you'll find out at practice, that's for sure. Like compared oh, to... I would ask, no, I would, I would bring up a U15A player. What'd we've you? Had, we've had, well, we've had three of them practicing with us. Yeah. But one of them broke her wrist, so she can't play. Are they better than Crockett? Uh, probably the forward. Crockett's probably better, but I don't think we got Crockett. Yes, you did. Jim said we didn't. I got the text from Spring last night. Okay, well, if it says that, no, Crockett. The other one was Brooke, and she broke her wrist, eh? Yeah. Brooke was our best forward last year. Yeah. So, no. So, uh, Paul Wanvig no, told me. I, it's a defense. So I have two defense that played for me last year, and they practiced about five or six times with us. Yeah. And well, the point and was. Olivia, Olivia could play. She's She was on the bubble making the team. Yes. That number 20 beat her out basically the last game. Yeah. So you can find it. You can. Can you find a replacement on defense? Yeah. Well, okay. that would that would be Olivia? Yeah. She's big enough to play at this level. Is she? It's quite a bit bigger than the other level. Yeah. Kyle Kyle Wanvig identified four players that he felt could play at that level. Now Kyle plays in the league. So I trust his opinion. Molly Crockett, Sawyer, and he had Gerlitz and Hector. You got, did you get Gerlitz? I think you got all three, Gerlitz, Hector, and Crockett. Does it say we got Crockett? Jim said we didn't. He did the draft. Well, I'm just going to my text. Okay. No, we can. I can ask if Olivia can play. But I'm just going to my text now to see what.
What time do you practice tonight, Tom? We don't. Oh, you don't have practice on practice Thursdays? Move because my daughter's, we practiced Tuesday, Wednesday. We practiced last night. Because oh, my okay. daughter, uh, there's a ceremony. She's receiving a major award at the university today. Oh, nice. She's at my department. So she's uh, getting some award from the president of the university. Yeah. So I'm going to that. It's at 2 o'clock. Oh, good. So I got my practice moved. So we don't, yeah. The next thing we got is pictures on Friday night and then uh, the game on Saturday. And then we travel to Boxall on That's Saturday. Good. Yeah. Where's your road trip to? Boxall. You get pierogies, Tom. Yeah, maybe. I remember the, that. Uh, really good hamburgers. Yeah. No, that Vauxhall rink, that Vauxhall rink, uh, if it's still the same people that run the concession, they were well known for their homemade pierogies. <laughs> I'll have to try those then. But that's a long time ago yeah, now. Yeah. But <laughs> Rick Puddock's in Vauxhall, is he not? No, Vulcan. Vulcan, okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just trying to look at my schedule for Saturday, Sunday. There's six games each day i gotta pick and choose but um uh, i've got an uh, i need a little advice here peter i'm mentoring and the two teams that tom coaches one there's two <clears throat> other teams and they're very competitive and i've been on the bench with the one that uh the parents are sort of on top of all the time so i want to be present to show them that we're working together to be the best we can be. And, and because they're playing each other th uh, this weekend, I have to choose whether I'm going to go on the bench and be visible. And I'm going to meet t tonight. I'm going to talk to uh, the coach of the opposing team. I may try to spend a period on his bench and then two periods on her bench, or stay in the stands. But I got to figure that out because the politics of being around, picking a team and being a favorite is part of the conflict that I can get into here. You ever encountered that mentoring? Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about, right? So you go on team A's bench for... The first period, yeah, right. There's going to be a certain group of people that say, "Oh, well, he must really like them because he went on their bench first. Yeah. Then, if you just, <laughs> excuse me, if you decide to go on Team B's bench for two periods, well, you like them better because you went on their bench for two periods and just one period. So, I think your best bet is what you said, view from the stands, and then if you're asked why aren't you on either bench because the stands are raised up i get a better perception i can see the game and the players much better from here yeah i mean unfortunately that's that's the reality of it yeah yeah i'm gonna talk to the coach tonight at his practice to see what he thinks because um uh, it's really a difficult situation and uh, i'm really at a loss um Politically, that's probably what I should do. But there's a lot of things going on behind the scenes related to this. So, and uh, Jordan, you've got your game on Sunday. Now, which game did you want me to join you? Saturday or Sunday? Jo Sunday, Jordan. Wally. Because I'm looking at, you're playing Okotoks 445 Saturday? Yeah. And Okotoks. 12-15. So it's two games back to back. Yep. Okay. And you've got somebody with you on the Saturday? Yep. Okay. All right. I'll just highlight that one in and make sure it's on the schedule. And I'll, I should be able to get back on time. 
because Roberta plays the Raiders at Ectus, so I probably have to get back on time for that one. So it should be able to make it. Okay. There's three games at Ectus. Jeff is playing at 11.30. Roberta at 3.30. So, no, I'll, I'll be able to make yours. I'll just make sure I can get back. Jeff's playing Rocky Mountain. At, but I'm going to, I've been to rest practice this week, so that's good enough, Jeff. I'm trying to get to one practice or one game a week of every team, Peter. And there's eight teams and it's i am just starting to feel comfortable with the u13 coaches where from the bench i can talk to them during practice they aren't distracted we can converse about what they're doing i can make a suggestion in fact yesterday because it was a neutral zone i was able to run a a puck protection thing, skating around the circle with pucks, the players, while the coach tried to poke the puck away so they had to protect the puck going both ways. And I had him do that after he did his one-on-one -on -one drive skate drill because they really didn't know how to protect the puck. So I was able to inter interrupt his practice, which is really awkward i'm sure it's not the most pleasant thing when you're a head coach but i felt it was i felt okay it's something that had to be done should be done i did it and i think they're more comfortable with it now that they know who i am and just a matter of trying to win their support have you been on the bench mentoring before peter I have over the over the years, I, you know, I've I've done that. I've been more more near the bench. I think, yeah, it's the way some of the rinks are set up. There's it's open to the back. It's it's very easy to kind of slide in, slide out, kind of thing. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's and it, it is. It's it's a bit of a slippery slope because um, I'm working with the youth organization now and. You know, my feeling is you were chosen as a coach of the team by the organization because they have confidence in you and you can do this. I'll, 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 like you're saying, I'll suggest certain things, but I'm, I'm not going to micromanage what you do. Otherwise, it shows a lack of confidence. And part of this too is I, I really want you guys to grow as coaches. Yeah. So. So that's kind of the approach I take. One thing I will say is, I know, I don't know maybe it's a couple of weeks ago now, you had uh, clipped out some things and you we had talked about the uh, the coach that essentially directs everything from the bench, yelling, this player here, you know, four check, go get it, this and that. Yeah. And that was, I sent that to my organization. Yeah. And I had some coaches comment on it in a positive way. So. So that was really good. That was uh, that was, I think, helpful. And I think one or two guys kind of saw themselves in that uh, in that conversation. But you know, Peter, it's interesting because the coach in question, I talked to him last night, and he is so on board with help, mentorship. He's gonna he he's gonna record himself again this weekend. In other words, the first time he did it, no problem. I just suggested it. He did it. He won. And he said he's even going to give it back to me. He'll review it himself and then give it back to me. So when a coach who's played in the NHL that number of years working with U13 girls now is willing to do that, that really tells you something about his open-mindedness to learning. Do you know what, what does that individual do as a profession? He and runs a supply company for oil drilling companies in Calgary. Okay. 
because what I found is, and I think Jordan will appreciate this, is the individuals I have found who are involved in coaching that are most open to the idea of collaboration and yeah, I want to get better. And yes, I'm willing to take on some help have been uh, educators. They've been the teachers. The teachers are very open to that. Like they know that they know it's theirs, but then they also are hungry to get, they seem like they're hungry, Jordan, to get better. Yeah, and the best teachers are that way all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I've got a bunch of my my wife teaches, my daughter teaches, my daughter in law teaches. So I'm I'm surrounded by it, and I really think as a coach, when I was coaching, that's I consider myself a teacher. You have the term coach, but I think you are a teacher. I think if you don't approach it that way, you know, you're you're kind of missing out. But yeah, I agree with you 100. percent now, Jordan, we were talking about mentorship. Peter, up here uh, in Alberta, Jordan acts as a formal mentor for one of the Alberta zone teams. And in that process, Jordan, do you think you could take Peter through the zone you get, how the team is selected, how you work with the coaches, and the role you play mentoring for short-term competition? Okay, uh, so basically what it is, Peter, is uh, in Alberta, there are at the U15 level uh, for female hockey, they have a, what they call the Alberta Challenge. Um, and what it is, is three North teams and three South teams get selected from a regional camp. Uh, so they'll have three coaching staffs from in the South camp and three in the North, and each coaching staff will get assigned a mentor. Um, I've been fortunate enough to go through that process uh, several times and and uh, I really enjoy it in that uh, I learn, I find I learn as much as they do uh, because I approach it that way. Uh, but I think the biggest thing that goes through it is as you're sitting through watching the camp and, and that with the staff is getting them to think about realistically, what are you looking to build? You're not building a team that you're going to be coaching for seven months. You're building a team that you'll have for a weekend. So that has them really drilling down into the real important pieces are those intangible pieces that the kids bring, as well as looking for, for character pieces along the way. Um, and that, uh, then uh, establishing the short-term competition piece is always uh, interesting. You know, try and get the staff communicating as best as they can together because these are typically three people that have never worked together before. Uh, and so it's stressing communication and getting on the same side um, philosophically of what they're looking for. And when you get to the point where they understand that it's just about providing the players an opportunity to play uh, and develop and have a positive experience and forget about the outcome, uh, it usually goes better. And especially when you get to the um, to the actual competition and things don't necessarily go the way that there's, you would draw them up uh, and have to deal with some adversity, usually those teams that deal with a little bit of adversity early and deal with it uh, in a positive way uh, usually have the best result both uh, um, on the scoreboard and, and away from it. So it's, it is... Uh, an interesting piece to go through because there's so many things that are beyond control that you're helping people navigate through and just reminding them the whole piece or the whole time. It's uh, uh, I'm, I'm not going to give you the answers. I'm just going to ask you questions and ask you questions, hopefully at the right time. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, so it's, uh, it's always been a, a great learning piece for me. And just the same as I want the, players all to have a developmental opportunity and, and great experience. I want that coaching staff to have the same thing uh, that, that they come away from it, having learned something, um, probably having worked harder than they've ever worked before uh, in many ways. Uh, and they come out <laughs> exhausted because they've, they've had to think about a lot of things, not just because it is a bit of a, uh, a time gauntlet too, that they're running through. Yeah, I, I think that's great. I mean, I think one of the awesome advantages is your 
um, area has that set up as uh, that's something that's normally happens. I'm working with a, a local youth organization, a town town organization. I mean, nice, like good kids. Um, I mean, historically in the last 30 years, I think two kids have gone on to play uh, Division One NCAA hockey and one Division Two, and then two Division Three. So it's primarily just a recreational type of a, a league. Uh, but I came on board to, they use the term coaching director, and I, I told them at the parent meetings, I don't particularly like that term because I'm not here to direct you to do anything. I'm here to offer the experience that I have and answer questions and try to help everyone have the best experience that they they could have. So it's kind of a, a new approach. The, the, the individual that I replaced was someone that was constantly at every practice, at every game, but more lurking than actually, um, I think, being there to be uh, people were receptive. You know, I, I want to go in. I want to go in there and have them say, "Oh, he's here." Not all. Oh, he's here, right? I, that's that's what I'm looking for. And and so far, little by little, it's it's coming along really well. We're doing monthly coaches meetings, which is something that never happened prior, and those have been going well because the individuals are asking me when the next one is, and uh, I love that 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 you you have something set up where you're able to do that and that people on the other side are receptive understanding that's just about making everyone better i'm not here saying i am better than you i like that it's great your monthly coaches meetings how did you get that set up and what do you do how do you run them um i'll have uh i'll have some sort of a theme or topic because I will. I'll pop into practices, go to some games and that, and I will see certain things. And then what I'll do is I'll make that on my agenda that I send out to the coaches and then ask them if there's anything they want to put on the agenda. So we'll go through that. And we'll talk about that. But really the best piece of it is, is then I go around the room and everybody gives an update and they talk about how their team's doing um maybe things that they they might need some help with uh areas of, of improvement and you'll you'll typically find that kind of like in life we all think that we might have this terrible problem be in this difficult situation that no one else in the world is in and then find out that pretty much every other person you talk to has dealt with the same thing so <laughs> <clears throat> so I, I think that's the truth. And I think in hockey, it's 100% the truth because there are only so many things that can happen in the sport of hockey, right? I mean, it, it, at some point, the, the you know, the, the wheel goes rack around from, you know, um, problem number, situation 5,000 back to number one. So everyone has dealt with those problems before and they begin to talk about it and be much more open and a lot less defensive and more collaborative. So it's it's a lot of interaction with them. I, I never sit there and, and and dictate, right? We'll talk about certain things, even when I have things on my agenda, and we might be talking about a method of play or, um, you know, the whole idea of uh, it's five players on the ice, right? You're not always in this spot. You're not always in that spot. We, we It's collaborative. We begin to talk about that. What does that mean? How do we accomplish it? So I, I think making people feel like they're part of a, a solution in today's world, it's very different um, than when I coached college. Well, at this point now, it's probably close to when I started, like 30 years ago when I was doing it. Um, it was much more my way or the highway kind of thing. And I like the way it's evolved from the standpoint of it's made me a better coach, I think, over the years. I have to be accountable and be able to back up why I'm saying what I'm saying, not just this is what I'm saying. Well, I've got a, a question. Uh, I don't know if Jordan's back or not, but when he gets back, I'll certainly bring it up. But I'll, I'm going to use Tom here and pick his brains. Tom, Peter sounds like he's got something going here where he has a monthly coaches meeting and it's he, it may be something to bring the coaches together and 
share their thoughts on what they're finding works well for them and what they would like think might they need to work better at yeah also also Wally too it's also an opportunity for them to say like what do you need from the organization and it might be something like hey it would be great if we could get some coaches coaches boards it could be it could be anything like that just that uh they they have a voice and someone is there willing to listen to what they're saying and and share it and try to help them move forward in ways that whatever they need really no, it's interesting. You mentioned the coaches' boards. <clears throat> I bought one for every team, magnetic board. And um, I'm sort of floundering here trying to figure out how to work with three age groups, three different sets of coaches. <clears throat> I don't know if you were on, but we got through a critical issue here with Jordan and Tom. <laughs> Jordan. Yes, yes. Yeah, I heard that. And that's that's very different than the way it works over here. Yeah. That's that's it's very different. I can see I can understand the frustration because it's it's different. And with us in and at least in, in like the youth organization, yeah. wreck it the way it works is you can you can play up, we'll say. I'm guessing that's time. Is that the case? Like if, if he takes a player from your team. Is it a lateral move for that player? Or are they "quote unquote" playing up a level? He's put. We're U15. He's U18. Okay, so they're playing up a level. So here, if you're if you play more than eight games up a level, you can't go back down. Yeah. So that's one thing. And then the other thing is, there's no actual rule. It's it's kind of a gentleman's agreement. So I'm down. Let's say I'm down a defenseman. So I call you up, Tom, and say, hey, Tom, this is my situation. Um, I'm playing uh, a really, really strong team this weekend, and I could really use some help. And you may say, well, you know, I'm in a similar situation. I need everybody this weekend. If I was playing a, a weaker team, I might be able to let the player go. And I would understand that as a coach, and that would be the end of it. That That's, that's it used to be, like, this is my seventh year in girls hockey Calgary. I've been gone for four when I was coaching college. But that's why the way it used to be is, you didn't take someone if you're, you know, if the team needed them. But now I guess it's if they ask, you have to let them go. And she played one game for him before and was his best. Team. She got a goal and an assist. She hasn't got a goal for our team yet. Oh, she maybe should be playing at that level. <laughs> but they don't allow underages up, eh? Which I b agree with. It's a... The, I'm working with an association with eight teams. That's it. Elite, they're called. And the idea of the philosophy is we're here to develop the best players to go up the ladder to be the best they can be. So one of the quandaries we've had here is they just drafted their affiliates last night. Tom drafted his um, from the U13 team below them. And now now we get into this quandary because we have had uh, managers and parents who don't like affiliates coming out to practice, let alone they don't mind uh, their daughter going up to play a higher level, but they don't want an affiliate coming up to their team. They'd rather have them play shorthanded. And so it's, it's like you can't win for losing. No, no. And that, honestly, I feel like that's been going on forever. That that whole that, that 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 it's it's difficult because it shows it shows a lack of ability to buy into a real team atmosphere. Right. Because if you're really bought into a team atmosphere, it, does this help us? If it helps us, let's do it. Let's go. And if it's good for this individual, that's great, too. That's where everybody everybody should win. Yeah. But it it for some reason there's always been that type of disconnect. And that has to have more to do with society and a, I think a, a, a bigger a bigger issue, a bigger picture. Oh yeah. Everything we're talking about is that. The issues you're dealing with, as trivial as they might seem, are bigger issues at a societal level. 
And uh, Tom, my question is, um, I had all kinds of thoughts about what to do. And one of them was what Peter has done. And I thought, I believe, how, how many coaches do you have together at once, Peter? Before you mean like for the coaches meeting? Yes. Well, the last coaches meeting I had uh, 17, because this is head coaches and assistants. So I had 17 of the 22 that were, that could have gone. So what age groups? Um, so it was uh, U8, U10, U12, U14. See, we're we're looking at U13, U15, U18 AA, and U18 AAA. Yeah, you have a different dynamic for sure because we don't have. This is just a town organization, so yeah. it's it's more it's recreational for sure. Yeah. Um. So it's not the AA or AAA type of a, a level, like a tier one or tier two. It's nothing like that. Which in some ways is good and fun. In some ways makes it a little bit more interesting because at least when you get to like when you get to your AAA level, right? Everybody there is, I would think, is bought in. Like we want to be a AAA player. We got a goal in mind. Um, whether, whether it may be be to play college, major, junior, hopefully professional someday. They're all they're all kind of dialed in. Whereas in the rec league, you've got everything from yeah, it's cool. I'd like to do it. Uh, my friends do it. Uh, the uniforms are neat. Yeah, let me do this. So it's a little different dynamic as far as that goes. <coughs> Excuse me. And then you also mix in the players who want to be serious about it and and do want to someday play in college and that. So no. in some it's it's pure in some ways, but in some ways it's a little bit convoluted too. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. It's very good. Tom, what do you think of the idea of, and I, I'm just throwing this out, um, a monthly coaches yep. meeting of staffs that they wanted to come, of all the U15s? I just need you to type that Themselves, up. or the U15s and 18s combined, or the U18s, AA, AAA combined? Can you give me 30 seconds? I the police sent me the thing saying I made a mistake registering. So Jim is going to try to, I don't know how to make one symbol on my keyboard. The, okay. Uh, All right. right. Jim, give me that up sign. I don't know how to. The joy it. of coaching, eh, Peter? The paperwork behind the scenes. Oh, yeah. You got to love that. We're, you got to love the digital age, let me tell you. Jim, give me your draft choices. From the U13s? Yeah. Um, we got uh, Hector. Um, Isla, the goalie. Uh, Caroline Carol Niedermeyer. Caroline Carol Niedermeyer? Sorry? Niedermeyer? Yeah, Niedermeyer. Uh, Adria Quinn. Quinn? And then... Uh, there's one more for uh, who is it? Kylie Gerlat. Well, I talked to uh, Kyle Wanvig, who knows the league better than anybody. He said Gerlat and Hector are mm -hmm. capable of playing up, and he picked four players. <coughs> Gerlat. Gerlach, Hector, Sawyer, and Crockett that could help U15 teams. Yeah, we got the we got the third pick, so Crockett and Sawyer were taken right away. So yeah. Yeah, they went up taking Gerlach. No, you did well. They played for Kyle, so you know what that means, Tom. <clears throat> They'll go through the wall. Yeah. Yeah, I registered for the police thing. They sent me a thing, you registered successful. Then they sent me a thing today saying you didn't verify, which I remember doing. Yeah. 
and now trying to get you back. You got legal in. help there, eh? Hmm? You got legal. Okay. They got the lawyer with you. Yeah, but it's just. Pain in the ass. This was my dad's middle name is McDonald. Peter, yeah, you still there? I am. Okay. Peter, how is, uh, did you try that mission statement exercise with your group or? I did. I tried it with a couple of groups, uh, kind of modifying it a little bit. Yeah. Just because it, it was really difficult at that point to try to get everybody together. Yeah. Because things have kind of been rolling too quickly. It should have been something that the organization kind of put together earlier, earlier, and uh, I didn't really get on board with them till later. So I did a little bit of a modification with it, where I, I worked close with the coaches, and I, I I talked about it at the parent meeting, and I had the coaches um, create uh, the mission statements. And uh, I think out of the group of, of let me see, it's two, two, four, s two, four, five, seven teams. Yeah, seven teams. I think three of them actually came up with and gave, gave an actual mission statement and sent me that. So I'm just kind of holding that under my hat a little bit here to see how these teams progress. And yeah. so when we have a, a final, um end of season kind of review um i think the teams that took the time to actually create the mission statements are also the ones at least based on how things are going right now will end up being a bit more successful yeah which will hopefully give a little fuel to next year yeah should they want me back should i decide to do it again but hey it's not um, it's not a coincidence that the teams who took the time to create this also yeah. had a better season. Well, Peter, I'm glad you brought that up because like the mission statement exercise, it's your job is a process. Yes, Coaching 100%. It's a process. And the outcome is being the best you can be and the exercises the values of working hard and working together to be the best you can be are what it's all about it it's it's so obvious to us with our experience yet without that experience younger coaches and parents tend to lose sight of the process and the foundation of effort and teamwork and respect and trust that are life skills that are lacking societal. <clears throat> no, I, and it's kind of a funny, so a little funny story with a uh, might a group. Um, and this is a, a fellow who good heart, like dad was in the organization years ago. Um, and he's at the might level. And so the mites play cross ice here, right? They don't keep score. So at the coaches meeting, he mentioned that uh, he said, we don't keep score, but I have one of the parents keep track. And he said, uh, we gave up 26 goals. OK, <laughs> so I, I was talking to him um, earlier in the week and, and he said, uh, yeah, we don't you know, we don't. I know. I, I know. I said we don't keep score. Remember, I said we gave up 26. I said, yeah. He said, well, we we scored 15 this weekend. And I said, it doesn't sound like you don't keep track of scores. <laughs> <laughs> he said, well, we do, but we don't. And, yeah. OK. All right. <laughs> and my my line is. The score clock ruins the game. It's the essence of why you play. And I think the philosophy of making each other better. Like I look at the three staffs, Tom and Sean and Roberta's staffs, three really good teams. I don't think anybody puts in the time and effort that Tom does and has the experience he does. But 
great staffs, and one's going to win, one's going to lose. And I'm in the middle trying to placate <laughs> the parents. I think the players appreciate it. They don't get uh, psyched out about winning and losing. They just want to make sure that they get an opportunity to develop and to contribute and feel valued in the process. So the uh, the exercise to me, whether or not I continue is going to depend on this exercise because it's an experiment, Peter. I I only wanted to do it with three teams. I didn't want to do it with all eight. It's too much. I only wanted to do the exercise, Peter. X's and O's don't matter. And what I've done this year, because Tom did it last year and it really salvaged this direction of his season, they hired me to do it with eight teams. So that means I did it separately with the coaches as a group. Three staffs, U13, three U15, two U18. Then I did it with each team's parents. And I'm just in the process of putting on a spreadsheet their statements. The coaches, Team Red, U13, parents, Team Red, U13, their mission statement that's to be put on a magnetic business card. One of the teams, actually three of the team statements were outcome statements. They weren't based on values. Process. And I reminded them of the exercise that the statements were be, to be written from the, the value words that we came up with necessary to get through the process to be, be successful. So two of the teams revised their statements so they jived with the coaches. One team, the parent group, I don't know if it's one or two of the parents, but I'm trying to get them to drop two words of their statement. And they may not because they're an outcome-oriented group. And the mission statement exercise and myself, I'm a process oriented group and I know it gets the best results. So I'm faced with this dilemma and I've only got one team that the two mission statements are at opposite ends of the spectrum. One's based on expectations and outcomes, the other's based on development and process. So that's my dilemma, and it is a full-time job, Peter. Like, that exercise alone, as far as the X's and O's, I, I think the way you're operating, you seem to be getting through. You've got a really welcoming demeanor and perspective, and I think you're gaining their trust and respect, and I'm still trying to do that with the parents, and I feel... I have a, the parents' respect to most degree when I'm present, and I sit with them in the stands, when, whether they're winning or losing, supporting the coaches, because they are doing a wonderful job. So it, it's a role that I think there is a place for us, guys like Hal and you and me. We can do so much coaching with one team but you can do so much more and affect so many more coaches and players in this role. And hopefully yours works out and we can stay in touch and see how it does. But like you said, at the end of the year, will you come back or not? It'll be up to them to decide. And in, in my case, it'll be up to them to decide as well. But I'm saying I, I don't want to be too frustrated in, in the process of trying to deal with ethical coaching and follow this plan. So 
No, That's you're right. And it, it's just like when you coach players, Wally, right? Like it, you had a team and it took a while to maybe get everybody on board. Yeah. Yeah. Hell, I don't know if you picked up enough of the chat, but ch chime in if you would. Uh, ring, ding, ding, chiming away. I don't know. Um, I agree you know, with your statements at the end. It's um, I, This morning, I was up at 5.30 to go watch my, my team skate with the Bantam team run by the high school coach, and they did flow drills. Right, big flow drills with most of the kids standing around most of the time. And then I stuck around after our group was done and, and, and the squirt group came out, they what's U10. And he ran the same drills with them. Yeah. And and there's no instruction. Yeah. Other than here's the drills, here's the drills. So anyways, I agree with you uh, that you know you can only you we can only do so much you can do one team or if you can get somebody to agree to let you work with three or four teams the leverage is tremendous and i've always felt that coaches coaches are the most essential um, element of creating the right kind of experience for the players um, and for development but they can also create a very negative experience. So, um, you know, we'll we'll never be short of work if we can just get people to hire us. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyways, uh, well, it's interesting, Hal, because you like Tom. You know, you should be a slam dunk coach's team as long as you live. Yeah. And that didn't happen. And Tom right now, because he's still coaching in a highly competitive female division. And, but in the past, he's coached in the same association and been replaced in a number of association a number of times doing things the right way all the time. Yeah. So I'm trying to do this in a way that the leadership organization understands what is the right way to be the best you can be. Nope. And that means selecting good coaches who are receptive to learning and change and growing, but it also means supporting them by having a, an ethical coaching philosophy and understanding what that is about development. And to me, the simplicity is, it's as simple as this, Peter, you can tell me, shorten the bench to win or use everyone to build a team that will win. And how you manage the bench is the art of coaching. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the only X and O part I deal with. Obviously, hell, doing madam drills with the U10 team, there has to be intervention here because some hockey knowledgeable parents watching that are wondering what's going on here. Well, I'll tell you that, I mean, I stuck around a little bit, and I mean, it's the high school coach running this. He runs the same drills for the high school. And, um, you know, the parents are clueless. They're, you know, they're, they're, impressed that the high school coach is running it because they're paying him to run it and um and they don't they you know they just don't get it they think this is great that squirt group had about 35 kids on the ice and trying to run flow flow drills with 35 kids mm -hmm. yeah. so anyways it's you know you try to change the world but you can only do it in one little corner at a time <laughs> Hey, Peter, did you did those videos open up for you? They did, yeah. Thank you for that, too. Okay. I really I really appreciate that. I'm going to be using some of that stuff for sure when uh, we have our next coaches meeting. Good. I posted, there's a group, well, I showed you guys that video of uh, I Love to Watch You Play. 
And that's there's a website for that. I love to watch you play. And the woman that runs it asked me to do some articles for her. And I gave her the article, uh, Cold Dry Hands, How Short Is Your Bench? Yeah. And um, she posted it a couple days ago. And she emailed me and said, oh, my God, we've had 100 reposts already. And then I got an, uh, uh, I got an email from a guy in Michigan this morning saying, geez, I, I, I saw this article. And before, <coughs> before I even knew who had written it, I knew it was you. And thank you for decades of advocating for the right way to, to, to manage a bench and, and manage your team. So. That guy's a shark lover. He listens to us. <laughs> he's in Michigan. Yeah. Uh, he's phoned me. We talk once a week, quite a while. Yep. Um, he really uh, loves what what we're doing. Yep. And I read he see, he cc'd me on the email. Oh, did he? <laughs> did he sent you? Oh, that's right. He did say he did copy you. <laughs> So anyways, I've talked to him before. He's, he's, he's a good guy. Yeah. So anyways. Right. Hell, where do I, f I found uh, that website that you were talking about just now. I'd love to watch you play. Where would I find that article that you wrote? Any idea? Um, <laughs> I mean, I go on it. I've got About Us, Podcast, Blog, Inspiration, you... Humor. Al, video. Put, it on, put it on the chat right now. So we've yeah, got it. I'll send you the I'll send you the link that to I think she put it in her newsletter. I'll send you the link. Okay, uh, great. I gotta find it, and or I can just send you a copy of the of, of the article too. Yeah, whatever That's, works for you. Yeah, see, see right. me on the that. one with the video, no, right? I can circulate. Yeah. yeah, I watched the video. It was good. The uh, the article I did I wrote it ten or twelve years ago, maybe more, and um, it. They, Let's Play Hockey in Minnesota ran it every year for a whole bunch of years. And uh, and it's apparently, I've, I've walked into arenas and seen it on, posted on the bulletin board. And it's been to Europe and all over. And it was really out of frustration because of, you know. What's the other... copyright residuals on that for you? <laughs> yeah, I'd be, uh, I'd be a rich guy, I guess. I don't know. But, you know, the people, we did get one negative uh, woman called and said, well, <laughs> you know, a lot of kids shouldn't be playing hockey because their skills are no good. They should just be happy to sit on the bench and be a good teammate and watch the other <laughs> kids play. <laughs> and I go, oh, well, you know, everybody's got an opinion on this deal. <laughs> wow. uh, it's too funny. So anyways. Well, I just finally got my police thing. You have to get a police check every three years or something. So I sent it all. I got things saying you did it right. And then I got a thing this morning saying you didn't do something. That's what I've been doing here. And my son finally got the thing through. <laughs> Is your son charging you for his legal time? Always. <laughs> <laughs> no, he got me off on a major traffic ticket in the National Park. We had to go to court in uh, Canmore. So I got him, I let him get the biggest hamburger he could at Wendy's. So. <laughs> wow. Listen, um, uh, is Jim still around? No, he's gone. He's gone back up. Yeah, I'm trying to. He's down here fixing this. It took. Yeah. It was so In my role, I I need to have a list of the names of the people that are affiliated, so I can watch them more because the affiliates or the call ups that are going to get up to the next level more than likely. Well, I think Spring will send that out to everybody. Well, I hope she does because. I I don't have the one for the community teams, like the U13 teams. They all have affiliates. And they're bringing different girls up for practices and some for games. But do you have an affiliation issue, Hell, in 
uh, in terms of numbers and players being called up and the, you being shorthanded. And Listen, we have, just I'll give you an example of what we've got going on in our program. Uh, we have at our Bantam level, we, we have the top team is an A team, and then we have two B teams. And between those three teams, there are only two goalies. And the A team has no goalie. So they get every game they play, one of the other teams in the district will send a goalie to play the game. They practice without a goalie, and they've only got 13 members on the, on the, on the team. We cannot bring, if we bring a player up, we can never send them down. We can't Ooh. send them back. So we have very rigid rosters. They don't technically get, you know, permanently uh, set till the end of December. But for all practical purposes, they're already all set and you have to go to get special permission. Um, and so that's a that's a tough, tough deal. But uh, when I when when we way back when we had just A level, A Bantams and then whatever, then they decided to go to double A and A. Well, when when you're a when you're an A Bantam team, you cannot even practice with a B Bantam team. But then they went to A and double A, and not only could you play each other, but they forced you into the same league against each other and had a separate double A league. They didn't, they, they, that didn't work for very long because people, you know, all of a sudden they had 60, 70 game schedules and the double A teams were just pounding the, you know, the crap out of the, out of the A teams. So then the, you know, the brain trust figured that whole deal out. Um, so it's, um, so no, to answer your question, no, we, there's, there's no player movement at all. Um, off season there is, they move around, but not in season. Hell, my, my, my question and sort of my whole point is the, it sports is a double-edged sword. And I'm sure you've seen that quote doing things the right way it can be wonderful but doing things the wrong way it can be disastrous yep and it's adults that are responsible for that and so in our positions as grandparents having lived through generations of players and coaching and leadership and teaching and principalships we have sort of the wisdom from a learning from all the mistakes of the ages. And that's the one thing I've found disconcerting when I retired from teaching. Here you're leaving and you have so much to offer nope. to the young teachers coming up. And I always felt a role could be found for retired teachers to support staff members and more importantly, support extracurricular sure. staff members who were coaching uh, to serve the, the good of education or the good of the game. And I think that's what you're doing is, you know, you're doing what you do out of the goodness of your heart and you might get gas money, but your experience is so valuable and um, the color of our hair is sort of it, it it usually leads to your extinction, but I think it should lead to distinction because uh, there's so much wisdom that can be tapped into, but it's our job to figure out the art of helping, yep. getting our word across and the word mentorship and I like Peter's conversation and he explained what he does and how he's doing it. I think collectively as a group, we can help ourselves get better at trying to influence others because we're all in the same scenarios, just different parts of the world. That's for sure. No, I agree. Yeah. And it's a little frustrating and, and even a, I've tried to work with our B coach, and but the, our problem is all, all all the coaches are parents. 
and they're just kind of moving up with their kids. And, and they, you know, it's hard to even get them to come to, you know, get to the rink on time. You know, they blow in at the last minute and they're the first ones out the door. Yeah, they can't now. They're required to be in the locker room to prevent all this stuff that's going on. That's a safe sport thing now. But I don't know why we had to make a rule that the coaches had to be around the kids. And, um, but we do, I guess. I got to get rid of that phone call. So I'm still working on some ideas to see if we can, see if we can, when I, and I did, when I did coach education for USA hockey, for the levels of certification, I did level twos and threes and occasional fours. I probably over the years talked to almost 10,000 coaches. Um, maybe not quite that many, but uh, clearly seven or 800 a year. And some of those clinics, I just ran the whole thing for four or five hours. And, um, and so, but now everything's online and, you know, if you don't do them in person, online is not the same because people can, can watch it online while they're having dinner and, you know, watching something else on their phone and that kind of stuff. So, um, it, you know, what we do isn't that hard, right, Tom? It's not that hard, <laughs> but... Um, and I, a phrase, yeah, I liked your phrase there, Wally, but I used to always say there's, um, there's, there's a right way to do everything. And then there's all the other ways to do it. <laughs> so this is the right way. You can do it in the other ways, but they're all wrong. I just got an email from the woman on that website. Let's, let's see what she has to say. Uh, Thanks for sharing the article is being well received. I appreciate the insight. Um, I'll forward this to you, Wally. Um, okay. And let me just see if there's a link to it. Um, uh, I don't know. This is pretty funny, actually, I think. Uh, And Peter, I'll find the article. I'll, I'll send you a copy of the article. I got to jump. It might be. A, I might have a PD. I have a PDF of it too. So, um, thank you. Yeah. I hate to cut. Let me see if I can find it here while you guys are talking about something else. A lot of that I could see what you guys are talking about about the different levels. Uh, the team that practiced after us. I you know, I'm leaving. The coach is on the ice. There's about five players. You know, skating around, shooting pucks around. Some players are wandering. They're all wandering out late. And as I left, a bunch of parents are bringing their kids to that practice. And we practiced like an hour and a half before that. And every kid was waiting at the gate for the uh, to be able to go on the ice. And it's just a totally different. You know, they were playing at a lower level, but a totally different uh, commitment by the parents for sure. Because they rely on their they're young, eh? so the parents have to get them there. <clears throat> and my parents probably had to leave work early because we practiced at four thirty. Yep. Well, Tom, remember your story at U thirteen the first time? They didn't understand the commitment. Yeah, we weren't. We, well, you're missing five from practice, so you really can't have any team play stuff. Because you have five players out there that have no idea what they're supposed to do. <coughs> but that, you know, we were never as bad as what I saw yesterday, but it was, uh, it really was amazing the difference of uh, remember to be there and be ready and all this kind of stuff. I changed my practice to... Uh, because we only had an hour, and I didn't think any other coaches were coming, but Mila showed up. So I, I changed it to things that they'd done before that covered the same themes. Because with an hour, <coughs> you know, you don't want to be standing a long time introducing a new drill or something. And it was really, really high and high intensity practice. But one of my goalies is hurt, the one that played the other night. She pulled her groin in the overtime. She made a fantastic save, but she pulled her her groin, so she wasn't there. And an affiliate goalie was there. 
her dad's taking over your job at the high school, Wally. He's, he, Ian, he uh, was athletic director there. Which school? Macomb. Really? Yeah, I you used know? to teach him. I used to teach him at St. Greg's. But uh, he's he's the athletic director at Lacombe now. Well, I'm going to pop in and introduce myself to that humble abode. It was a, a great 20 years of my life, that's for sure. Ian Couture is his name. He's also, he coaches a basketball, looks like, and he's also one of the coaches of the Colts football team. He was a pretty good football player. Yeah. I've heard the name. But his daughter's a goalie. She's very small, though. It's like about five foot one. So, Tom, are, to keep feeding her. Are you uh, shocked or blown away by the quality of your practices and the way the kids are performing the drills? Yeah, I was curious. To, that's why I'm doing it. It's a curiosity thing. I'm uh, throwing all kinds of new stuff at them. <laughs> they're picking it up remarkably well like when you watch the practice on tuesday yeah we did two or three new things <coughs> the thing with the defenseman and then the regroup with the two-on-one and you know they'd never done those before yeah and they catch on they're catching on you know pretty darn good and you know those are pretty they're really good drills but i uh you know I wondered if they could do them, and they can. They did them very well. The tactical skills were there. What the heck? The hockey sense was there. The thinking, the timing, the effort, the pace, everything was just uh, above average. You know, it wasn't just normally a practice. You see struggling, missed plays, the drill isn't flowing, it isn't running, it isn't operating. <clears throat> the intention is there, but it's sort of out of whack. But that practice was really, really well performed. And actually, well, the last to the Russian scrimmage was the same where I blew the whistle a certain amount of times because the last thing, we didn't have time to go through both teams on the power play game. Yeah. So, so they love that Russian scrimmage. And what really benefited is when I do it three, I make sure I'm doing three on three quite a few times. Yeah. Because we won the overtime because we covered them man on man on the three on three. And they left the one player wide open and walked in and scored. Yeah. You know, so that helps for that too. Just Can tell them you, it's the defense. Tom, I watched that game. Can you explain it for hell and, Jordan and Peter, because um, it is a, every variation of numbers where you have a man advantage or even number. Yeah, that's a part of like, it's The two games are the Russian scrimmage is I blow the whistle a certain amount of times from one to five and that many players play. And uh, then the power play game, we have gold and black jerseys, so... You start off with, uh, you can start off a one on one. I don't usually do that. I usually start off at uh, two on one, and then they play. And then when I blow oh the whistle, my. two on two, I blow the whistle at three on two. One team gets the, <laughs> the, the uh, six on five, and then the other team, and we keep score. And then the other team gets it. And you go through all, of, all the situations. But you can start with one on one and then two on one, two on two, three on two, three on three. I picked it up from Brent DeVoe. He ran, I thought he ran the best offensive practices I've ever seen. I coached with him at SAIT, the SAIT men's team. Yeah. 2018 19, he asked me to come and help him. And he, he's best friends with Bill Peters. They were line mates at college. Yeah. And uh, uh, Babcock was their coach. So he calls Babcock all the time, too. So he had a lot of really good stuff, I thought. And Mike well, Kennedy with that team, too, had a lot of good stuff from him, too. Like when, when you did that Russian scrimmage, um, 
one color is going to have the man advantage when you blow the whistle. That's a power play game. Russian On the power, power play scrimmage. Yeah. And talk about one random power, whole, random power play. Series. I thought that wide open freelance play, no positions kind of thing. Yeah. They were just going. And years ago in the conditioning camps we ran, Tom, we mm-hmm. used to scrimmage uh, different numbers, but they would go out one, two, three, four, five. One door come off the other. Yeah, yeah. So the scrimmages were all one, two, three, four, five. And <clears throat> they had structure, they four checked, they never gave up two on ones. And that's why teams are players and are so fixated. I got to play right wing. I got to play left wing. And the game isn't that. And I sitting with two parents. We play both those games with just total hockey. You just read how many players are in front of you. Yeah. uh, You know, that's how we try to do it, that they read the game and play it. They, they just come flying off the bench, boy. They they love those two games. Oh, they get into it. Tom, I love that Russian scrimmage. I used to do that all the time. Did you ever do it? You, you know how you always have those kids on each bench are like a little bit super competitive, like in a good way, in a fun way, and uh, they they they're begging you for a one on one. Did you ever do uh, it with a one on one? I've we've done that in the past, and it's a lot of fun watching the benches just like cheer on for those kids. Yeah, we've done a few one on ones. I'll do, I'll usually do that if we have like a a ninety minute one. So, you know, so I have a little more time. Yeah, yeah, but that's that's always fun to see, and they really, it, it's so much fun watching the kids, just all of a sudden become children and players, because they all of a sudden they're 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 cheering for each other, and they can't wait to see. Right, how many whistles you're gonna blow, and they just love popping out there. It's awesome. It's that's great drill. Well, that's one of the yeah, it's one of the best ones I've come across, and I've just you know, like I said, I picked it up at college about four or five years ago, and I'd never done that before. It's it's really good. Did you did you send that when you sent me those uh, that list of drills the other day? Um, if not, can you send that to me again? I just sent you guys three articles including cold, dry hands, uh, by email. There's another one I really like is, you know, hockey's an easy game to play from the stands. <laughs> you know when I really realized that? When I was an eye in the sky in uh, Salzburg. Yeah. There and you see, oh, they should have done this, should have done this. Here. <laughs> You're watching it. And then I would go down between periods and talk to uh, Paget and Rutsalena and tell them what I saw on. But I I realized that because as Gene Riley, this American guy, would say that to me. <laughs> Pretty easy from up here. But now because I still play, I see my players or any players screwing up and I say, damn it, I did that yesterday. Oh. <laughs> well, I... You know, I watch. I'll watch a wild game, and I'll watch them make mistakes, and I go, "Huh, oh, yeah." Our our team does exactly the same thing. Well, they're the, they're all the same mistakes. Yeah. Like I bet you, ninety percent of the blind backhand passes go to the other team. Yeah. Adri did a terrible one two weeks ago. He's up by the blue line, and he does, and Calgary's on a power play, and he does a blind backhand pass, and it was zero zero, and they got a total breakaway and scored. One zero. Yeah. Who, who made that pass? Kadri. Huh. He did a blind behind the back pass right to the, I think it was St. Louis. My guy was gone. You know, I have to mention uh, the com- competition internal three teams in the same league under the umbrella of, the, of girls hockey Calgary. And the tension during the games by the parents and their feeling state, whether they, when they lose, 
the dejection and <laughs> the emotional drain. And I'm sitting there. You know what? Every one of our teams is doing better than the Edmonton Oilers and the Edmonton and the Calgary Flames. I mean, even at the pro level, think about it. Like, and well, well, I think it is too because hell, they added a team, so my team's a new team, and of course, the two other teams wanted to be able to protect some players. I said, well, no, you can't do that. You protect three, so that means the six best players are gone right at the hop, eh? So it was an open draft. So all my second year players played for one of those other teams the year before. So they know everybody. Everybody knows everybody, right? So we played this uh the red team and they won the provincials last year. And we beat them in overtime and we were lucky to beat them. And uh oh yeah, the emotions after. But like Wally kept track of the passes. We made 80 something and they made 10. <laughs> and our first three goals were as, at the end of three passes. And how they got all their chances is our F3 wasn't back and we're pinching. So they chip it by the D and then get outnumbered situations, right? And so all their, they weren't on, they made one nice pass on that, but uh, they were just, in races one on one on five all the time so it's a totally different way to play the game but See, so this, this league i any team can win and there are better teams in um in alberta and when girls hockey calgary went to three teams at the apparently at the demand of hockey alberta uh, it upsetting to parents because they think that's watering the level down. And watering the level down, it's so relative. Like the numbers are growing, the hockey's getting better. Uh, I I had to debate, debate the support, the argument with parents who felt, well, there were players on the team that weren't good enough. Like, so parents are saying that, thinking others aren't good enough. Well, holy cow, you're a team. Everybody's good enough. Just treat them that way and motivate them. And uh, I think it's going to be a great, great year, a great league, very competitive. Just keeping everybody happy and realizing, just be thankful you get to play this game. And like Johnson said, Bob Johnson Every day is a great day for hockey, you know. Well, a challenge is, hell, a challenge is because they, they went to another team. Your, your bottom third of the team wouldn't have made it before. Yeah. So I, the challenge is you get those players that they can all compete at this level. Yeah. And, you know, and I think that, the ones that do the best job of that will be the ones that do the best. Yeah. The one that do the best job at what, Tom? Well, developing everybody. So, you know, like we play, we pick players that competed hard and could skate. We've got some that the puck is not their friend. And, uh, you know, so we got to get so they can handle the puck and make plays and stuff like that. Yeah. And, you know, and every team's got that challenge. So whoever can get, so every player on their team, they can put them out and they can get the job done is going to do the best. That's my yeah. intent of it. That's why I think you have to play everybody. Oh, you do. Well, boys, I have to go in a second, but uh, Tom, I, you, you, you would be smiling because I have, <laughs> I have one of my, uh, sort of our fourth coach who does it not on the bench, his son's on the team, and he's keeping track of, of, of completed passes during the game. He's using a using the board that just just like you guys do, is it? Yeah. And uh, we got up to 85 passes. We had to play the best team in our division. You know, they have like 1,300 kids in their program. We have like 300. And we were 2-2 with a minute left in the game. And then we we 
He uh, didn't play well the last minute and ended up losing, losing the game 3-2, which was a great learning experience for the kids. It was, it was unbelievable. Um, and we had like 85 passes in that game. And it's like, that is, you know, so the kids are getting better. Yeah. And, and now we're going to get our last game. We're going to get after them in practice now because a lot of the drills that we're running, if they're regroups or if they're breakouts and, and, and heading up ice, you know, they're, they aren't passing as much as they should. So there's going to be consequences for no passing. Um, if, if, you know, if skating by a teammate. <laughs> so to speak, but we're finally getting some ice time where we can actually we can actually do some of this stuff, and it's really fun. I'm really having a good time with these kids. So, yeah, that it's a great stat. Yeah, Wally, Wally did our last game, and he did both teams. Yeah, and that that's what we do much better than the other team. Yeah, but you know, hell, the interesting thing in that game. Uh, the other team could have won. Like they had quality scoring chances. Yep. And so the passing stat literally meant nothing if they lose. And you're wondering how do people regard that? You know, and I just say if you're passing, you have possession, you're using each other, yep. it, it's got to be a distinct advantage. Well, I mean, both teams in this game had scoring chances that they didn't convert. Both teams had breakaways that they didn't convert. I think we had one that we did, but um, you know, as a, my my license plate on my car, which is now in storage, it's three dash two OT, and um, you know, because that's the perfect score of a game, or even in regulation, because you got good goaltending, you got lots of offense. And, you know, you, if you shorten your bench, you're stupid because you're going to run out of energy. And everybody, everybody's involved. And, and I use this thing with them that I think one of you uh, told me, is we win, we tie, or we learn. And uh, the kids are fond of that now. They get that. So what did we learn tonight? What did we learn? And we, we can't take timeouts. And so, you know, if I had been able to take a timeout, I would have to settle the kids down and just because they thought they were still trying to win the game. And I was thinking, well, I'd, ha I'd be happy to tie the game because we get a point out of it. And, you know, there's only 60 seconds left. Right. And, and they're the best team in the league. And then we have a thing called fair play points. I don't know if you guys have that up there. So if you penalty minutes are below the threshold, you have a you get you actually get a, a point in the game. So if you do that and win, it's a three point win. But we we went from a two point game to one point game because we got fair play and we didn't get any points for you know because we lost we, we lost the game in that last minute. So got to run, boys. Hi, Jordan. How are you? Um, we'll see you guys next week for sure. I'll be there for the whole the whole show next week. So have a good weekend, everybody. All right. Thanks, Hal. Yeah, we'll see you guys. Tom, I was going to add something to you. Well, Hal could have heard it too, but uh, uh, something that we did here recently that it was just one of those ideas that uh, kind of came to me and it, it worked well in our tournament this past weekend. Um, you're an old gym teacher, so you know the uh, – the flip uh, scoreboards that you used in uh, when you when you'd uh, have two two games going on or whatever the ones that you just flip the numbers on them. Yeah, yeah. I took one of those with us to uh, Regina and had it on the bench, and the forwards had to flip one end and the D had to flip the other when they changed when they came off. Yeah. And the goal was to try and get that to thirty every period because. 30, 30 shifts would mean 40 second shifts. Yeah. And uh, it was interesting that the, the buy-in that we had um, and we got to it and we probably wouldn't have won uh, or wouldn't had, we had zero gas left by the end of the fifth game anyway, but we'd had even less if uh, the kids were playing their one minute shifts that they'd been playing before. So uh, it was interesting to see them buy into that one. So. Especially in terms of another game or two. two in a day and stuff, eh? 
Yeah. Listen, I have a question about the instat. Jordan, you got those stats. Tom. I used to. I I only get them every so often and I know I got the first one like two weeks ago. How? I've done them, but they never send them to me. Yeah. Well, how how can I approach who can I approach to make sure they come regularly? Well, it's it's huddle and it, it depends on how well the the game film gets to them. So like um since we use Actus and some of those rinks where you don't get a really good film, then what happens is the, uh, or it's not high enough to get numbers, the numbers on the jerseys properly. Okay. Then, uh, because it's all computer generated, like the yeah. computer searches for the numbers and does it and produces that. So, but then the other one was when we had a game against Fire Red, because it's two Calgary teams, then they had trouble with that one for some reason. We didn't even get the the printout from that one. So yeah. well, we got our last week. We went into overtime, and they Huddle didn't do the overtime. <laughs> and I asked, I said, "Are we going to get this?" And I didn't have it videoed. I usually have it videoed because we only had one game, so you know there was another game to get kind of get ready for. So I, you know. I didn't get the the uh, UOT. No, did, uh, did you send me Tom the huddle stats from uh, the red game? I don't know. Just check. I'd like to go through them. Just looking, I wanted to see how many shifts they had, just as a check to see how close to the number they were, because you were the guy that was initiating the thirty seconds. Shift. I never on 30 seconds. Oh, 40 seconds. Yeah. What I'll do is at 30 seconds, if there's a face off, I might change the lines then. You know, okay. because they're going to be on for a, another 30, 40 seconds if they do a face off. Yeah. But, you know, try you to do it. Anybody that is inclined to stay out too long? Well, there's people that are inclined both ways. The, some of my uh, fringe players, they're afraid they're going to get benched if they stay on too long. So huh. they they come off, you know, they, they take about two-thirds of a shift and come off. So they'll get as many shifts, but the ice time total is down. Nobody's calling them off. They come off on their own. Yeah. So, you know, so... Jordan, one of the things that, you know, you had me help out and we were talking about effort and shift like that, you went to the flip, the score flipping on the bench. Um, is that still a number one priority for your team or do you feel it's something got to be constantly reminded of or? Oh, I, I think that that's something that it's a habit that they've gotten into over the years and and uh yeah it'll take more than just one weekend's focus or a couple of weeks focus we're going to continue on that but i think that the buy-in is coming because they're starting to see that they have more gas in the tank at the end of a game and uh kind of like hal was talking about there with the uh, desire not to shorten a bench is so that uh, you can run those teams that play with a short bench into the ice. And uh, so, and that's where you'll get the opportunity for skill and, and that to come to the forefront even more uh, is at the ends of each period and at the end of games. And uh, I think back to a uh, conversation I had with Mark Howell about uh, his season last year. And he said that, that uh, they didn't lose a third period in the, uh, in the last two thirds of the season. And it was because their team was, was changing at a rapid rate and that they were in such good shape. And so those other teams were running out of gas. And he said, that's when we would pull away from them is in the third periods. We're finding that this year, except on Sunday, I've, I've got one elite speed skater, right? And there's a major competition. So she had to go to Edmonton. She won. So she qualified for the Alberta games, but, that gave us uh, 
10 forward. So we've had one go through. <coughs> Usually we have, you know, we rotate one line through. So we have four lines, but I noticed our girls were really tired compared to other times because we we're basically three lines. Yeah. Well, that's, we ended up in that in Regina, Tom, because, uh, um, because of injury out there and sickness. So we ended up, we had, uh, um, we started with 10 forwards because of injury and 6D. And then we ended up with uh, playing some games with nine forwards and uh, 5D um, because of injury and stuff that we dealt with there. So it was, yeah, they were gassed by the end of that tournament for sure. Well, yeah, if you play, that's a lot of games. We play yeah. like when we went to Kelowna, we played six games. And the weekend yeah. before we played in the fire starter four games. So yeah. we they got 10 games in like eight or nine days, I think. So you talk about flow uh, practice as well. Our Tuesday practice, I made it so that there was a lot of movement. Um, and we were basically, all the kids were saying they're sore. We were basically trying to get uh, lactic acid out of them because they were, they were tired and sore from it. Yeah. No, it's just, we did, we, yeah, we did have an, like, Cassie's kids being practiced with us as the extra forward, right? To give us four lines, but she broke her wrist the night before. So, oh, geez. We had no forward that had practiced with us. Uh, well, we've got one that we're waiting on an x ray for a wrist, and we've got another one with a broken hand. And, and then, of course, Kyle's got a D out long term with knee. So then that's shortening things and then one forward that that uh, the family felt guilty because they have taken a warm vacation they've never taken a warm vacation during a hockey season until this year and uh, the time they take it is when we already have two forwards down yeah. so. but, uh, listen both of you when you don't have a player uh, you're an injury is the first instinct to move a D up to fill the spot? Not necessarily. It no, for I, me rather, it was. I'd rather go oh. with D than have five D. You so you'd move up one up, Tom, and have five D. No, no. I'd rather like you know, like we haven't had less than 10 forwards so we just go this on sunday we rotated the extra forward Tess played with a different line every period yeah. and then on the penalty kills we'd uh, have her be one of the you know we put one line out to kill the first you know and she'd be part of that two sets of two yeah four but then at the end of the game, she ended up with our top line and she scored two goals. That's probably going to be our line. Because we wanted to try her with different lines. But uh... See, my old school thinking automatic, I just moved a D up. And then, especially when, when it, even numbers of forwards, it just allowed people to distribute the energy and the ice time. Well, it wouldn't give us even numbers, eh? Yeah. Because we'd, go, we'd have gone from 10 to 11 again. Yeah. And 5D. So if we drop down to eight, eight forwards, I'm sure we'd move a D up. That's what we do in the old man's hockey all the time. Yeah. <laughs> you know, pull a D out to play forward. Yeah, we got Rich Press and on Tuesday, that's what happened. We had... We needed a forward, so he came and played with us. We, we figured he was good enough. You, you loaded up. <laughs> well, he kind of plays a hybrid defense. You get the puck, then you get to get the puck up to him because he's gone flying by us. So. <laughs> it's not much a difference. Uh, I sat and watched the practice uh, two nights ago. Um, a guy you play old timers with, Hempel was up there. 
you know. uh, what's his first name? I know so many guys. By their I don't first... know. I don't know, but his uh, his daughter's the girl, uh, the mom that's first Jordan, in school. Jordan Hempel. I think so. Jordan might be his first name. Yeah. No, that's the daughter's name. No, Jocelyn is. Or J Jocelyn is her name. Jocelyn. Oh, Jocelyn. H Jocelyn Hempel. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Well, anyway, guys, it's been a good two hours. Glad to, yeah, I got to go teach grade six construction. <laughs> well, I, now I've got to get a hold of the flames because I changed visas, right? So I called them a month ago. I gave them my new number and I got a thing from them saying your payment didn't go through. So obviously the guy I called didn't write the number down. Didn't put it in right. Yeah, and the same no, thing with the police thing. I got a confirmation that I'd done everything right and all this. And then I get an email this morning saying I didn't verify. And I remember verifying. And they gave me a you know, a letter saying you did it right. So that's what Jim was helping me with. That was really awkward to get it done. But we finally yeah. got it done. I can't mm -hmm. remember committing any crimes lately. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay, everybody. Friend that was coming down for the Flames game. 